This is our last video on the discrete Fourier transform before we switch topics and start discussing the fast Fourier transform, which is a specific algorithm for computing the DFT in a very efficient way. We have just a few loose ends here to tie up a few things I wanted to mention about the DFT before we moved on. One of those was the properties of the DFT. Obviously, since the DFT lets us compute either samples of the Fourier transform or samples of the discrete time Fourier transform, it's probably not too surprising that the DFT inherits many of the properties that the Fourier transform and discrete time Fourier transform have. For example, we're going to list these right here. The uh, DFT is a linear transform, which means if I have a linear combination of signals in time, there, the DFT of this linearly combined signal is just a linear combination of their DFT coefficients. So just like the Fourier transform and the discrete time Fourier transform, the DFT is a linear operation. Note that we're not going to prove any of, the, of these, we're just going to state them because they should sound very familiar to the properties we have proven for these other transforms. Just like these other transforms, the DFT has conjugate symmetry. If I um, shift my samples of my DFT coefficients by uh, some amount that conjugates in the other domain. So that should sound um, kind of familiar. If I do shifting in the time domain, so time shifting, so if I actually take my signal and I shift it some amount, that introduces an exponential, so a complex exponential with kind of like a phase slope in the frequency domain. Again, that should sound very familiar. We've uh, seen time and time again that shifting in one domain introduces a linear phase in the other domain. Uh, we see that again here on the frequency shifting property. If I shift in one domain, I get this exponential in the other domain. And then there's also nice properties with convolution again. We know that when we deal with linear convolution, linear convolution in time is multiplication in frequency. Something very similar here happens with the DFT. Convolution in time is multiplication of the signal's coefficients in frequency. The subtle difference here is this symbol. Usually we would write down the convolution operator there, and that's almost what I wrote down, except it's a circle around it. Instead of just that star, there's a circle. We use that symbol to represent something that we call circular convolution. Circular convolution assumes that the underlying signals you're working with are periodic signals. If you're dealing with periodic signals, you only need to evaluate this convolution on one interval, and then that pattern repeats uh, periodically. So that's what we mean by circular convolution. Most of the time when we do work, or often when we do work in discrete time signals and systems, we don't want to do circular convolution. We want linear convolution, because linear convolution is what describes the input and output relationship of linear systems in the time domain. So one thing you have to be careful with is if you want to use this property here of multiplication in time is convolution, I'm sorry, multi multiplication in frequency is convolution in time, and you're using your DFT coefficients, the convolution you're going to get is circular convolution, and that might not be what you want. If you really want linear convolution, you have to take care to perform zero padding, to pad the signals appropriately, and then do the multiplication in the frequency domain with the DFT coefficients of the padded signals to get out linear convolution. So some of the details about how you go about doing this are listed here. We will actually work through an example of using DFT coefficients to yield linear convolution by doing this zero padding appropriately later on in this video series once we discuss the FFT. So pay attention and read through these bullets here. Be aware that there is a thing called circular convolution. That is what you get when you multiply DFT coefficients in the frequency domain. If you actually want linear convolution, you can get it if you zero pad appropriately, and we'll get to that later in the video series. All right, just uh, kind of closing up with some final comments about the DFT. Some things that we've noted that I just wanted to emphasize once again. If you're dealing with continuous time signals that have kind of infinite frequency content, meaning they, they don't have this clear stop where the spectrum goes to zero from then up, 
you're going to have to make some choice as to how to sample. You can't sample at the Nyquist rate because the Nyquist rate would be infinity. You have to make some smart engineering judgment call on how fast you're going to sample. And no matter what, you're going to have some aliasing occur because you're getting rid of that frequency content. You're not capturing it. So you're going to have some kind of errors in the DFT. Obviously, the faster you sample, the smaller those errors get reduced but you'll just have to use engineering judgment based on your particular application. So increase as much as you can, but exactly how much you can is going to be limited based on your particular circumstances. Also note, you know, every time we do these DFT computations, we get uniform samples of the underlying spectrum in the frequency domain. So we've got these uniform samples, and you just have to be careful. When I'm sampling uniformly, what lies in between my samples, I don't know what is there. So there could be peaks or features of the spectrum that you've kind of jumped over that lie in between those samples. That was really the whole point of the video we did just a minute ago about resolution and zero padding when we dealt with those two sinusoids. So just be aware that you might be missing out on some of those peaks. If it's possible to sample faster and get more data points, that's the best way. Getting more real data will give you better resolution, which means you'll be skipping fewer peaks that might be present. So more data is always better to a point. So if you can get it, that's great. If you can't get more real data, zero padding is still something you might want to do. Zero padding doesn't improve resolution, but it does give you more samples on the underlying curve that you're working with. So the amount of data you work with and how much you zero pad are also very important things that you need to decide as you're working with the DFT and the FFT. So that's it for now. Let's uh, move on to the FFT and we'll start with that in the very next video. Thanks for watching.